Welcome to CryoTalk, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Featuring conversations between your host, Ava Amson, and experts in the field of cryo-electron microscopy. Today on CryoTalk. Today on CryoTalk, we're joined by Peter Shen, Assistant Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Utah. He tells us what initially drew him to cryo-EM. It's a way to answer mechanistic questions about um, biology is to directly visualize them. In fact, in my lab, we have this theme or a motto, if you will, a seeing is believing. How creating the Cryo-EM 101 course led to developing merit badges for the National Centers for Cryo-EM? It was during the middle of this uh, funding period where we realized that you know, we need to continue to innovate and develop resources to, to bridge that expertise gap and what he does in his spare time. We have a, a weekly um, series of pickup basketball that's led by graduate students and postdocs, and they've been generous enough to let, let um, old faculty members like myself join them. <laughs> All in this episode of CryoTalk. Hi, and welcome to CryoTalk. I'm Ava Anderson, and I'm here today with Peter Shen. Peter is Assistant Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Utah. So hi, Peter. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for asking, Eva. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, great to have you. Now, the first question that I usually ask people on this podcast is if you can just maybe tell us a little bit about your career so far. Yeah, happy to. <clears throat> so I'm an Assistant Professor here at uh, the University of Utah, and I've started my lab um, in 2017. So I've been running my lab for about five and a half years now. And the theme of my lab is uh, that we care about the mechanisms underlying protein homeostasis. And this really refers to the balance between how cells make proteins and gets rid of proteins that either um, the cells don't need anymore or perhaps problematic proteins that could cause uh, harm to the cell. And so there's the constant balance between how cells make decisions of how, um, when to make proteins or how to make proteins and how to get rid of uh, proteins that are no longer needed. And so in our lab, we have a lot of projects that uh, cover different aspects of, of this theme, including how proteins are made at the ribosome, uh, how proteins become folded, and also the flip side of that equation in terms of how proteins become unfolded prior to their degradation. It sounds like it's uh, it's very much like the basic principles of biochemistry that you're trying to figure out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I think that's really what has drawn me to <clears throat> to this field is that it's it is very fundamental in nature. All of our cells rely on <clears throat> the orchestration of proteins doing their, uh, fulfilling their intended functions. And unsurprisingly, there are many diseases that are associated with proteins not being able to work properly. Mm. So this is a theme that um, has attracted me for a long time, ever since my postdoc. And um, so excited to be able to run a research program to, to be studying yes. this, this yes. very thing. And and one of the tools you're using is uh, cryoEM. So how how are you um, using that, and how do you get started with cryoEM? So I'll answer the second part of that question: how I got started first. Um, I like to say that I was doing cryoEM long before it was um, cool to do cryoEM. No offense, <laughs> but uh, um, I started. I became first exposed to cryoEM when I was when I just started graduate school at Brigham Young University in 2006. And at the time, I had never heard of the method. Um, certainly, you know, the field wasn't where it is now in terms of technology or, um, um, or capabilities. And we were fortunate at the time, the university had um, a great microscope, um, 300 kV, um, um, FEI TF30 microscope, you know, side entry holder. And at the time there was um, um, a lab, I ended up joining the lab of David Belknap um, to, to study virus structures. And so cryo-EM at the time was great for studying 
things that are really big, uh, things with uh, a lot of internal symmetry, which viruses um, certainly fit the bill. And the reason I got drawn to that is because, you know, I remember the very first time I saw a cryo-EM image and I just couldn't believe that we could see <clears throat> these biological particles with our own eyes. Um, you know, I, I remember the first time seeing a reconstruction and thinking, oh, is this a simulation? But no, these are actual reconstructions generated from cryo-EM images. And of course, the, the field at the time, you know, was very limited in terms of resolution, but that's how I became uh, initially exposed to the field. And then, you know, over the years, I like to think that I've, I'm just so lucky to have been in the right place at the right time, to have stayed in the field and to have witnessed um, the amazing technological advances and thinking that the best way to answer mechanistic questions about um, biology is to directly visualize them. In fact, in my lab, we have this theme or a motto, if you will, a seeing is believing, that there really is no better way to understand biology than to be able to directly visualize the, the protein complexes that we're interested in. And so I've come a long ways uh, from studying virus structures to now studying still big complexes, but much smaller than viruses uh, and through, through cryo-EM. Yeah. So have you, have you noticed that over the years, um, obviously the technology has changed with you as well. Are you taking advantage of, um, the, I guess, the technological advances in cryo-EM? Yeah, I am. I think, you know, the field is continues to be in a golden age. It's still so exciting to see the advances that continue to be made in terms of hardware advances and uh, software advances where we're not only being able to uh, improve resolution, but also to recover um, uh, multiple conformation of states of a protein of it or, or a target of interest. Um, and so my lab, you know, we, we try to stay at the forefront of the technology. Uh, just this morning, I was playing around with this new tool from uh, Shores Shears Group uh, that um, has an automated model building feature where if you have a good enough 3D reconstruction, it can um, um, automatically build an atomic model for you. Oh, wow. <laughs> and yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating tool. Um, and so I, I think the direction of the field is that you know people are still innovating, and that we're really not um, we're we're really just scratching the surface in terms of the potential of uh, what we can do with crowd EM and um, image processing. Yeah, yeah, and I I love that motto: seeing is believing. <laughs> that's uh, that's definitely what it's all about with cryo EM. Yeah, um, I and mean, just to add to that, I. I mean, I remember my first uh, experiences, you know, doing um, biochemical experiments as an undergraduate student or in undergraduate labs. And, you know, thinking it was really cool that, you know, we could see bands on a gel for proteins and DNA, or can see uh, spectral peaks for different uh, spectroscopic techniques. Um, but, you know, there's always, it's always um, satisfying to me to be able to actually see the thing that um, yeah. we're studying. Yeah, it's a different level. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and now you've also been involved with um, cryo-EM training, um, for example, with the National Centers for Cryo-EM. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm happy to. So this, um, so I'm part of a program that's funded by the NIH um, that has led to the creation of um, what we call Cryo-EM 101. And this uh, was created in partnership initially with Janet Iwasa. And over the past couple of years, we've also extended or expanded our program to also create um, training for cryo-electron tomography, uh, Cryo-ET 101. And this is in partnership with Julia Brash. And so the history of this is that um, in 2017, this was around the time when the NIH um, started to put out calls for um, uh, proposals, grant applications to create curriculum development materials, recognizing that there is quite an expertise gap in the field where um, there's 
burgeoning interest in people wanting to learn cryo EM. And the NIH was ready to fund uh, national centers uh, towards this so called synchrotron model, such that you know, not every institution is going to have their own cryo EM facility. And so there, you know, how do we bridge that gap <clears throat> between those who don't have experience doing cryo EM but want to gain access to national centers? And so at the time when we applied for this curriculum development grant, um, you know, I don't think that we intentionally could foresee that we would be working so closely with the national centers. But in hindsight, of course, this is what needed mm -hmm. to happen. Um, and so <clears throat> at the time, Janet and I, we created Cryo EM 101, which covers um, the basics of really all practical steps of a Cryo EM workflow from sample purification and grid preparation, all the way to data collection and uh, data processing. But at the same time, these national centers were up and running, you know, multiple high-end top-of-the-line microscopes at each facility. And they would also provide their own training courses. Um, and we're glad that they're also using a CrowEM 101 material, but there still is that skill gap between um, those who don't have the exposure to uh, CryoEM resources and, you know, how do people know if their sample is good enough for CryoEM? And so it was during the middle of this uh, funding period where we realized that, you know, we need to continue to innovate and develop resources to, to bridge that expertise gap. And so uh, this has now led to the creation of um, what the, the national centers uh, leading this so-called merit badge program where um, students, learners can earn specific merit badges that cover a distinct aspect of uh, the cryo project workflow. So for example, um, how do you freeze a grid? And so this provides some level of certification so that newcomers can um, essentially be certified to use these instruments. Uh, and the spirit of these merit badges is then that they're cross honored across mm -hmm. the, uh, the three national centers, um, NCCAT, um, PNCC, and S2C2 at Stanford. So like I said, that standardizes the bit. So now they're, they all have access to the same information. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. It standardizes the, the procedure and, you know, and this is something I think the field um, needs. Um, and especially if you have a trainee and, you know, you're going to put them in front of, you know, an expensive instrument, you know, you want to have a certain level of trust that, you know, you have them freeze their grid, but that they know what they're doing. And so having that certification through a merit badge, um, would would add that confidence um and so i i think the spirit of the program is exactly what the field needs and um do you have any insight in um who has used the cryo em 101 resource since it launched like how many people yeah. where are they coming from <laughs> um so we, we recently reported this to the NIH, so it's a little bit fresh in my mind. But last I checked, which was a, a few weeks ago, we were at about 43,000 unique um, learners worldwide. And about half of them um, come from the United States. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, the, the hotspots of those who are visiting Cryo em 101 or using Cryo 101 material are those who do have um, um, existing Crowian infrastructure, but probably have a growing base of mm -hmm. trained, a growing base of newcomers who, who want to know um, the, the very basics. And so the way the Crowian development um, um, uh, groups um, have been structured, I think has been really nice where we have different levels of expertise and also different groups who cover um, different um, different aspects of cryo-EM. So for example, you know, we consider ourselves, you know, we really thrive by the one-on-one level 
of cryo-EM-101. That is really focus on the basics. But then if people really want more uh, deeper um, knowledge, then there are Grant Jensen's, uh, you know, very well-known series of um, uh, lecture videos. Um, Fred Sigworth has a series of uh, videos that really takes a deep dive. You know, that's more very advanced uh, cryo-EM theory. Um, and then there are more hands-on uh, curriculum development tools uh, through uh, using VR tools that are developed by a group at Purdue. And then more recently, it was a group funded um, to develop um, more image processing-based tools called CryoEDU, where they do simulations of, um, of image processing results so that people who might not necessarily have their own computational resources can at least go through these simulations and see what happens when they make good or suboptimal decisions and the effects of those decisions on their outcomes. And so it's been really neat to see how these curriculum developers have come together and offer complementary perspectives. And so here at the with our Crowdium 101, it really does focus on the basics. You know, what does a good sample look like? What does a suboptimal sample look like? You know, um, and once um, once these newcomers have established or at least have some basic understanding of uh, calibrating their expectations, then I think this um, can save a lot of time and resources in the long run. Yeah, definitely. So from, I, I guess you also have a little bit of insight in um, the, the, the variety of people that use CryoEM. Um, do you think that has changed over the years? Like when you first started, were there, was there a typical type of cryo-EM user and is that different from what they are now? To think a little bit about this question. Mm -hmm. we, we do have limited access to this data because, you know, when we look at our web traffic analytics, it doesn't mm. break down the types of visitors, but, um, you know, we do have um, a way where people can provide feedback um, on course materials, or if they have more specific questions, they have been able to reach out to us specifically over the years. And my sense, and I don't have hard numbers to back this up, um, is that, um, but my sense is that the general pro proportion of training level has remained pretty consistent over the years in terms of most of the people who reach out to us are early stage graduate students or stuff, but there certainly are a lot of faculty members that have also reached out. Um, you know, for example, um, trained crystallographers who uh, are great biochemists and probably have great samples, but haven't had hands-on experience with crowding instrumentation. So those would be faculty members who have reached out to us. But I would say for the most part, it's um, um, early stage graduate students. But the level of our training materials, I would say even catered to, um, to undergraduates, you know, people who are learning about structural biology at a very basic level where nowadays, and I think um, as I hearken back to my own undergraduate experience and learning about you know, X-ray crystallography or NMR, certainly CryoEM was not uh, in that mix um, when I was a student. 20, 20 years ago, um, but now I th now I think cryoEM is probably part of mainstream um, undergraduate curriculum, and uh, um, the way that we've designed cryoEM one hundred and one is that it should also cater to that audience as well. Yeah, and and do you think that having um, early hands on experience with cryoEM um, can help students find jobs and academic careers? Yeah. So one of our motivations, biggest motivations for CryoEM 101 is that you can, uh, someone can read all they want about CryoEM theory, but there really is no substitute for hands-on experience. Now that said, we also recognize that that is a limitation of the training tools that we've put, um, uh, we've posted on our website because there is really no hands-on components, but we. Yeah to emphasize you know through the videos that we've posted um like walkthrough videos of you know this is how someone handles a side entry holder this is how someone clips a grid uh, and prepare so, so that they could be loaded into an auto loader and so 
having those tools available at least helps the learners um, become, give them a certain level of preparation so that when they do, when it's time for them to have that hands-on experience, it's not a complete foreign experience to them. In fact, I would say that the ideal workflow is that um, a lot of the um, national centers, they host workshops for these purposes. And so prior to a student attending an in-person hands-on workshop um, uh, hosted by a national facility, for example, that they would have referred to uh, Crowdium 101 materials that maximizes their preparation, um, again, so that it's not a complete um, foreign experience for them when, when they do it. But then it's, in order to be certified or to have that experience to be marketable for next steps, they, you have to have that hands-on experience. And I think there really is no substitute for just um, time in front of a microscope or just mm. that muscle memory of how do you freeze grids or how do you clip grids. Um, the time in front of a computer screen evaluating what is a good image, what is a bad image. Uh, and so I think there are multiple layers, mm. multiple steps. To, to gain that expertise, but we're hoping that Crowley 101 is yeah. a, a good starting point for that. And and do you think um, that over the years, the instruments have become more user-friendly? Like, are, are there more entry-level instruments now for people to start using? I definitely think that the field has progressed uh, in the right direction in this regard. Um, so does that make it easier for students? It, it does. And I think um, I would say for most, in my experience, most students probably don't have as much time in mm -hmm. front of the microscope or driving a microscope as um, as they deserve. And, you know, depending on the facility, for example, it's understandable if, um, you know, you don't want to trust uh, complete newbies uh, to to fiddle around with your multi-million dollar instruments. <laughs> but along those lines, though, it's um, the level of involvement to, for example, align a microscope has been greatly simplified, even to the point of automated um, compared to, you know, 10 plus years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And so... I would say that a lot of the skills that I learned as a trainee are probably considered antiquated, you know, in terms of, um, you know, aligning a side entry microscope um, or even operating a side entry holder. I think, you know, the fewer and fewer institutions are supporting those types of instruments and, you know, seeing the new microscopes that are coming out where, for example, you have dedicated screening microscopes that are pretty automated. And so I think the level of, well, maybe not necessarily the level of expertise, but the, the focal points of the expertise have shifted over the years where, you know, <laughs> I don't know how many hours I've spent in, for example, developing film, um, yeah. for, you know, used to collect cryo images on film and, you know, no, no one does that anymore. Um, and so for my own trainees, and I'm sensitive to this when, as I'm bringing in new graduate students and postdocs that I'm thinking about, you know, is it really worth um, your time? You know, would it make you more marketable if you, um, if you had these skills? And maybe less so, and I would rather have them spend their time on, on using state-of-the-art instrumentation so that they can focus uh, more on their own projects rather than the technical expertise. That makes sense, yeah, thanks. Um, I want to change direction slightly and ask you, um, so we've talked a lot about, about work and cry OEM, but what do you like to do when you're not working? Do you have any hobbies? Or... Mm. Um, <laughs> hobbies, some things that come to mind. Uh, I like playing basketball. Um, and so uh, our department, we have a, a weekly um, series of pickup basketball that's led by graduate students and postdocs, and they've been generous enough to let let um, old faculty members like myself join them. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with them, but um, that that is one hobby. Um, I'm at a stage of my life where 
a lot of my time is uh, focused on the three kids that, that I have, um, ranging from um, elementary to, to middle school. And, you know, that comes with a lot of time spent on sports and music lessons. Um, but turning that into also a hobby where I'm practicing sports with them or we're playing music with them. Um, and then just over the, and I would say uh, another hobby that comes to mind, something that we've picked up over the past few years is uh, really enjoying the great outdoors here in mm. Utah, just have so much access to, to the beautiful um, wilderness, including five national parks. In fact, just this past weekend, uh, we spent the weekend uh, down at a national park and um, got to get away from the city for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, nice. I, I, and the, when I heard you were in Utah, I was kind of expecting you to mention the outdoors because it's one of those states where you know people go outside, and you, you, you live in a place where other people travel to to go outdoors. So, and so um, funny enough, you know, I didn't go to my first national park until about five years ago. I've spent most of my life wow. here in Utah, but I certainly didn't take advantage of of the beauty that we have here until much more recently. And that was wow. in part spurred by, uh, you know, kids getting older and just needing to find new, um, um, more bonding activities. And boy, I just think about how much I've missed out on not taking advantage of that sooner. Yeah. And, uh, and, and when you're indoors, um, do you, do you have any, um, like things like, do you like reading or films or music? Any recommendations, perhaps, for our listeners? <laughs> hmm. um, when I'm indoors, we at home we play a lot of board games, um, mm. and it's fun. Where you know the, the, the kids are um, at the point where we could play more strategy-based games, and so we definitely any favorite games. <laughs> um, it depends on who you're with. I would say if you're with a uh, a bigger group and you like chaos uh one game that we love is called captain sonar uh, i don't know if you've heard of it but no. uh, it, think of it as a battleship on steroids where you have two teams uh that is in charge of navigating a submarine but trying to blow up the other submarine and so you, the two teams are sitting on uh, opposite sides of the table and things are happening in real time and so people are talking over one another and you're trying to eavesdrop and keep track on uh, what the other team is doing. And so that's that's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, we, we like a lot of puzzle-based games, um, you know, mixing, mixing and matching certain tiles. Um, so the game Azul comes to mind. Um, another party game that we, a go-to game that we like is called Code Games. Um, but anyway, there, there's so many. So I think if you open our closet at home, there's probably more than a hundred games and some of them are probably still shrink wrapped. So that's something that our family uh, definitely uh, enjoys indoors. And so the other thing is that we're, um, we like music. And so I play the piano, my wife oh, okay. um, plays the cello uh, and our kids play different instruments. We have someone learning the viola, uh, someone playing the guitar yeah. and the, um, someone playing the violin. And so we like to find songs where we can um, play with each other or a company. Uh, yeah, one. that's um, great. I, I actually play violin myself. So yeah. I love hearing that. Uh -huh. And your kid that's learning viola is going to have a lot of options because all the orchestras are always short of violas. <laughs> no, and that was a little bit of a tactical decision when he started <laughs> yeah. to think about what instrument he wanted to pick up. And so, yeah, uh, he's enjoying it. Yeah, that's great. So another question that I love asking people is, if you were not a scientist, what would you be? What would you do? Have you ever thought of that? <laughs> Certainly thought about it. Um, I think probably in a practical sense, I come from a family of lawyers. Um, and it's actually something, a career track that I considered. Um, I, after graduate school, something that I considered, you know, in the middle of my postdoc. Um, I don't think I would have been very good at it, but might have been a practical um, option. But in terms of um, 
things that would be more fun. I thought about uh, food trucks, <laughs> um, uh, something about uh, operating a mobile kitchen that is always drawn to me and some of my favorite food uh, is, is from food trucks. And so, um, yeah, when I was a boy, I wanted to be a pizza delivery driver. So <laughs> you can tell that I'm, I'm drawn to food. Um, Amazing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you like to cook? <laughs> well, I like, so after just saying that I would operate a food truck. <laughs> um, I, would you have to hire a cook? Yeah, I, just would to, <laughs> I would say I'm very privileged to have a very talented uh, wife who cooks very well. Um, and she, you know, explores different cuisines. And so I've definitely benefited from that. <laughs> I really like to make sushi. Ooh, um, nice. something we do on a pretty regular basis. Um, and so, um, but that, that might be the extent of my culinary skills. <laughs> well, that's pretty difficult. I can never get the rules to stay together. So mm -hmm. the trick <laughs> so. is in the rice, having really good rice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that tip. Going to try it again now. <laughs> um, and the last thing I wanted to ask you is uh, we always ask our guests for a little piece of advice. And I think with your experience in cryo EM training, um, is there any piece of advice that you would give students who are interested in a career that involves cryo EM? I would say the first thing that comes to mind with that question is um, something that I tell um, everyone who's interested in joining my lab is that, um, you know, as long as they're surrounded um, in this environment is to ask questions. Mm. Uh, in my experience, that's always been the fastest way to learn. And I would say it's even more uh, important so now um, because my, my sense is that, you know, we've, we have moved into a more isolated mindset um, naturally because of the pandemic and emerging out of the pandemic where we've gotten used to isolation and gotten used to trying to figure things out on our own. And I think to an extent, you know, we have to do that. We have to do our own due diligence. Um, but for trainees out there who have the benefit of being surrounded by expertise, you know, ask questions. Uh, I love it when people can just walk into my office and just want to want to chat. Um, I love it when people drop me cold call emails, you know, after um, browsing Cryovium 101 and wanting to learn more. Uh, and I always make it a point to, to respond uh, to, to cold call emails. Um, and so that, that's the first thing that comes to mind is to ask questions because it is oh, the fastest yeah. way to learn. You know. That's great um, advice. And uh, yeah. I think that's a, that's also a good thing to close on after I asked you so many questions and you've encouraged people to ask more questions. So I think that brings us to the end of our episode today. So thank you very much, Peter, for being our guest today. And thanks everyone else for listening to or watching Cryo Talk. Thanks, Eva. <laughs>